ladies and gentlemen, Marlon Williams. So 1993, I'm at Wayne State University. Yeah, right. Wayne State University, but back then we were called the Tartars. I don't know anything about this warrior stuff, but that's a whole other thing. So I'm at Wayne State University living my best life, I thought. I had just uh, pledged a sorority. <laughs> don't stick with that sorority, okay. Um, I had just pledged a sorority. Um, I was probably like a size four, okay, that's a lot, like maybe a six, eight, ten-ish. One of those. Uh, <laughs> I am fine, I feel like I am fine. I'm stepping around to parties, having a good time, and I was about to graduate. And understand, I was on a six-year graduation plan. Um, and everything that happened in between is a whole other story, so hopefully they'll have me back because it was, took me six years to graduate. What was interesting is that during the time I was at Wayne State, I worked two jobs, took 24 credits, so I worked from 9 to 12 at the school center building. This was called Sioux School Center Building. They would let me have lunch hour, and I would take a couple classes. Then I would take all evening classes. Then I would work at UPS, and I went there at midnight. And so on Michigan Avenue, I remember White Castle was right there. I think it's still there. So on Michigan Avenue, and then I would sleep in my car for a couple hours in front of the Math Eye building, which was a gym building, then I would just do it all over again. And when I think about it now, when I think about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship for me meant freedom. Because what was happening and I didn't understand is that I was in this rat race. And when I say freedom, I watched my parents work really hard. So I believe it was just this systemic, systemic thing where this is just what we did. You gonna hustle, you gonna work hard. And so I felt that if I could become an entrepreneur, then I could help my mom and my dad. Now, mind you, I grew up in an amazing, amazing home, but my brother and I were latchkey kids. Anybody know what latchkey kids are? Yeah. All right, so I got this big key around my neck. My mother like, you better go, you, you pick him up from school, do not separate, you go home together, you leave together, we go in the house, we make ourselves something to eat. And it was not because my parents were neglectful. They had to work. They had to work to take care of us. So by any means necessary, I was going to be an entrepreneur so that we could do more things together and so that I could help them. Interestingly though, at Wayne State, I started a company where I was going to be a speaker. I wanted to travel the world and speak. I, I didn't know what else, but that was what I wanted to do. However, the grown people in my life, <laughs> and my mom is here, so I'm not looking at you, because I can kind of see you. Um, but the grown people in my life said, hey, you need a job. You have to work. You want a pension, and you need to work. So I leave Wayne State, and I become an aspiring mortician. I work at Swanson's Funeral Home and Peace Chapel. I leave Wayne State, and I am a mortician. Now, one thing about me, whatever I do, I'm going to do the most. And I was the best. I could embalm you, I could dress you, I could kind of do your hair and makeup a little bit, um, but both my parents are ministers, so I could sing at the funeral, and I could pray at the funeral, I could drive to hearse, I mean, I was all of that. I was, I was amazing as this mortician, but I was so not happy. I knew something was missing, and I still, in the back of my mind, I'm like, but I want to talk. So I would talk to the decedents. I would talk to the people. I'm like, you mattered, and your family loved you. And you know, I mean, I would, this is what I would do. And so, 1995, someone came and said to me, hey, CompuWare Corporation is hiring. And they're looking for people they can teach to be computer programmers. I said, okay, I don't know what that is, but they're paying $24,000 a year. $24,000 a year, I'm 25 years old, it's 1995, you do the math. I was going to be rich. <laughs> so I wish I could tell you, yes, I was gonna be a computer programmer because I loved it and I'm a geek and no, it was full benefits and it was $24,000 and I could finally leave my parents' house. So I took the job. 
And I will tell you, it was one of the hardest things I have ever, ever, ever done in my life. Every day I would walk in that building and I would quit. <laughs> Literally, I would walk in and say, hey, today is it. I would try to time it in between pay periods though. Like, okay, <laughs> I need my money, but today is it, I'm quitting, I'm done. But there was a man, his name was Omari Bayi. And Omari Bayi is his brother who created the entire program. And he believed in me. He believed in me more than I believed in myself. And so this program, they said, we're gonna teach you to program in seven languages in 13 weeks. Seven languages in 13 weeks. I'm like, okay. I can do that. So when I left that program, I emerged as a mainframe programmer. Anyone know what a mainframe programmer is? Yeah. Yeah. I know, I, I am so dating myself. But <laughs> so I became a mainframe programmer and this is where I knew where the power kind of was. My favorite language was a language called CICS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so CICS gave me the power to know this is something. I am sitting here programming and writing code for ATM machines. So when you put your card in that machine, somebody wrote a code to say, yes, that's you. No, it's not you. I could write code to say, you want $50, but you have two? You're not getting it. <laughs> Sorry. So this was my life. I mean, it was so powerful. And so I'm working in technology, I'm at CompuWare, I'm growing, I'm doing amazing things. But what was interesting is that I noticed that more times than not, I was the only female, and for sure, I was the only black person at the table, <laughs> for sure. And so then became my passion for diversity and inclusion. I'm like, you know what? I have a whole bunch of friends who look like me. And you can make $24,000 too and have benefits. <laughs> you can do this. And so my work and my love for diversity and inclusion came at that moment. And it, just, it became a part of my life's work. So I'm working through CompuWare. I mean, I'm doing the most. I am growing. I am learning. But then I decided, you know what? I want to get off the freedom bus. Anybody work in diversity and inclusion? Let me tell you. Diversity and inclusion is a matter of the heart and the head. It is not a job that you leave at work. My office was like a revolving door. People coming in with problems and disparities and they aren't treated right. And you can't work in diversity if you don't have this empathy. And so for me, I would just take it home with me. How do I fix this? What do I do different? But remember, I said I was making money, and it was $24,000 back in 1995. Fast forward to 2003, my girlfriend's mom said one day, you have giraffe money. I'm like, what is giraffe money? She's like, you have so much money, you could like, buy a giraffe. I'm like, you know what I kind of do? Like, I could, I could buy anything. Because in technology, you make a lot of money. And so I started making money, so much money, it was ridiculous at times. So I was feeling myself. I was very conceited, I can say that now. I was in denial, I had to get therapy. I was in denial for a long time. <laughs> but I was conceited, I was doing all that. I had a huge house in Sherwood Forest. Um, I had luxury cars, I could just get on a plane. I mean like literally, I'm gonna show up at the airport tonight. You having a party in Atlanta? A party in LA? I'm just gonna go to the airport and get a ticket, I'll be there. Just craziness. But. I said, you know what, I'm gonna pass the torch. I don't wanna be the person fighting for diversity and inclusion in tech. I don't wanna be the black person at the table telling y'all that we need more people. So I need to pass this on to someone else. I am getting off the freedom bus. Not remembering that diversity and inclusion in tech afforded me a whole bunch of C's. So I became the chief diversity and inclusion officer for two Fortune 500 companies. I was the chief information officer for the city of Detroit, where my team and I coordinated all the technology behind Super Bowl 40, which is why you weren't stuck in traffic, and we just did a really good job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I also was a two-time tech CEO. So trust me, I am living the dream, but I am done fighting for human rights. I'm not doing it. 
I'm just going to live for my family and I. 2012 came. And my life changed in a way that was, it was almost like, have you ever been in a situation where you are here, but you're looking at your life over here? It's like you see, you, you see your life happening. It's like you're having an out-of-body experience. So in 2012, marriage number two, yeah, no, I didn't even mention number one, but no, <laughs> it's just, trust me, it's just, it's just, it's a lot. So marriage number two, marriage number two is ending. I'm like, I'm young. It, it, marriage number two is ending. My house went into foreclosure. This beautiful home that I loved went into foreclosure. There were times I had to decide, will I buy gas or will I buy food? <coughs> After they repossessed the car, the gas wasn't an issue, so <laughs> I could buy the food. My daughter got kicked out of public school, I mean private school, and everything was just spiraling out of control. I'll never forget the day my family came over to help me move my boxes out of this place. And I moved to a much smaller place with my daughter. And I said to myself, I gotta fix this, but I just didn't know what to do. Have you ever been in a predicament where you know that something has to change, but you just don't know what to do? And trust me, I'm a pretty strong person, so I thought. But what I realized in this moment was that my net worth was tied to my self-worth. I didn't feel good about me. I am walking around talking about how wonderful I am and I am woman, hear me roar, and I am all of this. I looked so good on the outside. I'm on a red carpet. I'm on Channel 4, so I'm going to TV, you know, every other week, talking on the couch on Channel 4. Didn't know how I was going to get the gas to get there or to get the bus. It was just a mess. I looked so good on the outside, but on the inside, I was raggedy. Just a hot mess, raggedy. And so what happened is, I thought I was losing my mind and I couldn't take it anymore. So I found refuge on my couch. Because after I got divorced, that was pretty much all I had. I had a couch and my daughter had a bedroom. And the couch was raggedy too, but the couch was where I sat. And I said, you know what, I need to take a life sabbatical. And what that life sabbatical looked like, I turned off the TV, I got off social media, I couldn't hang out anymore. And during that time, T.D. Jakes, Oprah Winfrey, Ayala, Marianne Williamson, and A Course of Miracles were my best friends. If it wasn't that, then you can't talk to me. Because this is what I had to change my life. But I remember at my lowest point, my mind, I think, was playing tricks on me, but it kept saying, you don't even deserve to be here. Your daughter would be better off without you. You made a mess of your life. You don't deserve to be in this space. And it was one of the first times I ever thought about taking my life. And I've never shared that with anybody. Because I didn't feel worthy. I felt as if I had just messed everything up. I felt unloved. But what I found out later was that I didn't even love myself. I didn't like myself. I couldn't forgive myself. And I remember, this went on for a while. And I'm just like, I got to shake this because I deserve to be here, I think, but I don't know. And so I will put up affirmations all over the house, and I'm trying to say affirmations. Sorry. There was one song 
that I heard. And it said, um, I am just a prayer away. Call my name with your heart. And now hear every word you say. When you cry at night, I'll wipe your tears away. It was like a voice saying, Marlon, just pray, my love. I'll be there right away. That song ministered to me, and I believe it brought me back from doing the unthinkable. And then there was almost like a rage, and it was like a shouting, like, how dare you? How dare you decide that you aren't worth it? How dare you decide that there's nothing else left for you to do? You don't get to do that. But then on top of that, sweetheart, how dare you decide you're going to get off the freedom bus? You are here to serve. You are here to help. You are here to empower. In 1993 at Wayne State, you said you wanted to talk. You said you wanted to speak. You said you wanted to empower. And now you're talking about you don't want to be here. You don't get to do that. You don't get to leave your family and your child. After that, you guys, my life changed. I became even more bold. I became even more determined. I became even more determined to show up for my own life and vote for me. So in 2013, I was getting off a plane. My mom and I had gone to, uh, I went to go speak at Tom Joyner Family Reunion. And I came back and I remember, I'm like, why do they even want me to come there? You know, you know I'm, I'm still going through this thing, but then Techonomy called as we were getting off, the, getting off the plane. The Techonomy is this big global tech conference. And they said, we want you to come and speak. And we want you to talk about diversity and inclusion in tech. And I'm like, okay, you know what, I'm gonna do this, but I don't even know, once again, why they want me there. I'm on stage, and they said, hey, what are you going to do to change this tech scene? And I said, I'm gonna start a company called Sisters Code. Now, I had thought about the name Sisters Code, or either God again, I don't know how Sisters Code came up, but in that moment, I said Sisters Code. I didn't have, I didn't know if the name was available. I didn't have a card. I didn't have an office. I had nothing. And I said, and I am going to teach women ages 25, because I started to code at 25, to 85. I'm going to empower them in technology. They are going to know that they too can do this. I got off stage and people were surrounding me and I'm like, Jesus. Um, Give me your card, I'll call you. I will give you a call, thank you. I'm gonna call you, no problem. Yes, this is our, uh, I, I, don't even, I don't even know how I came up with this mission. I, I have no idea. But Sisters Code has now, in three years, empowered over 450 women. Thank you. To become computer programmers. One of my favorites is Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones was 62 when she walked in our door. Ms. Jones now is a teaching assistant for us, and she owns a business where she creates small websites uh, for churches. There's another young lady who was a Zumba instructor. Now, on top of being, being a Zumba instructor, she's also a software developer. And it ties all together because in my story, I had to go through three levels of surrender. The first, back in 1995, I had to surrender my identity because I was going to be a mortician. That's what I was going to do. But I had to surrender that thought and understand that what God had for me was much larger than anything I could have ever thought of. And here I am entering into this tech industry that I know nothing about. Then I had to surrender to my truth because I was living a lie. I was living this lie, living above my means, raggedy, on the inside, glamorous diva on the outside. So I had to surrender to my truth. And then lastly, and this is the largest one, I had to surrender the I for the we. 
because it wasn't about me. And I thought it was. Even the, it, it wasn't about me at all. And so I'll leave you with, in entrepreneurship and in life, we are all intertwined. We may look different, we come from different places, we talk different, but it's all about that service and what we can do for one another. So that I for the we piece is one of the reasons I'm standing here today. And my mission 10 years ago, and my goal in life was I am living my life as a vacation, traveling the world, first class, all expenses paid, as a speaker, media contributor, empowering people. And today, I get to do that. Thank you for listening. Marlon Williams.